Chapter 24 The following day, a bright one, MacLeod made his way to the bridge in Central Park. Before he reached it, he could see Castigier leaning on the parapet, keeping a wary eye open for the Kurgan. As Castigier had said, there was no point in fighting each other until one of them had defeated the Russian. Hey, Castigier! called MacLeod. The black face creased into a grin. MacLeod, it is good to see you again. I was only thinking last night, after I left you, that it seems like a hundred years. MacLeod grasped his hand and shook it. It has been a hundred years, and you know what you did to me then, you bastard. Castigier laughed. Ha! <laughs> I remember. Look, are we going to walk? Yeah. They took each other's arm and began to saunter through the shrubbery. They could have been two French courtiers of Louis XIV's era, strolling through the gardens of Versailles. How have you been? asked MacLeod. Oh, not so bad. A few years here, a few years there. It's a living. They both laughed. Oh, by the way, I brought you some of this, said Castigier. He reached inside his kaftan and brought out a bottle. What's that? asked MacLeod. Boom boom. MacLeod shook his head. Castigier seemed disappointed. A big strong man like you shouldn't be afraid of a little boom boom. But MacLeod knew well that anything given him by Castigier had to be taken in the knowledge that there was more behind it than just a drink. It could be a practical joke, or it could be something more serious. MacLeod did not want to test it out. You don't trust me, MacLeod. I don't trust anyone. Very wise. I might be trying to poison you. Laughed Castigier. <laughs> ah well. He shrugged and put the bottle back inside his kaftan. Some kids ran between them and their arms, unhooked, now remained that way. Both men glanced occasionally at the bushes, but knew that the Kurgan would be a little foolish to attack them while they were together, when he could take them one at a time. So said Castigier. The gathering is here. Time has almost caught us, my friend. Has it? MacLeod looked at the black man. Do you think we should go on? Castigier smiled. You've grown weary of life at last. It comes to us all, doesn't it? A time when there is Nothing new. Even when some fresh discovery is made in the eyes of the rest of the world, to us it's still a great yawn. We've seen from swords to nuclear missiles, and many a year between. There's nothing left of interest. Yet, we still want to live. Isn't that so, MacLeod? The Scot nodded. It's the part I don't understand. To be utterly weary and sick of it all, yet still be reluctant to leave it. More than just reluctant. Yes, we would fight to the utmost lengths of our skill to keep something we don't really want. Castigier laughed. You're not in love then, at the moment. I was only in love once, ever, and that was enough. Not the loving, but the parting. I don't wish to repeat the experience. She wasn't good to you? She was my wife, and we were everything to one another. I am only half alive. Castigier was serious for a moment. So, yes. I know what you're talking about. I, too. 
but he clearly did not want to open himself to MacLeod. They walked on for a bit in silence. The park around them was full of families and loners, couples and groups of youngsters, infants and the elderly, all forms of human life. In a way, it was not their world at all. They were aliens amongst these people, not because of their origin of birth, but because of the twist behind it. Castigir slapped MacLeod on the back. A hundred years. I think I see you every century. That's pretty regularly, isn't it, MacLeod? It's a regular meeting, agreed MacLeod. Castigir said, The time before Zululand was in Boston, your famous duel. Do you remember? MacLeod smiled. Castigir said, We had a party. 1793 it was. 1783, not 93, said MacLeod. And you were drunk. Castigir waved a finger in his face. So were you, I recall, my friend. At least I was sober enough not to insult the wife of a famous swordsman. I only insulted, you know what I mean, replied Castigir. MacLeod did indeed know what the Ethiopian meant. Castigir had been posing as some eastern prince at the time, and both had found themselves together at the party of a Bostonian judge. The wine and brandy had been flowing quite freely, when MacLeod found himself pursued by the ugly wife of one of the first gentlemen of Boston, a wealthy shipowner by the name of Bassett. MacLeod did his best to get rid of the woman by fair means, but when she followed him into a bedroom, which he had chosen as an escape route and started to remove her clothes, he called her a name. She paled, told him he was no gentleman, and went to fetch her husband. Mr. Bassett entered the bedroom with a single glove in his hand. He marched up to MacLeod and struck him around the face with it. Swords! said MacLeod, too drunk to add any words on either side of that single reference. Time? Now. Place. Here. Not good enough. Boston Common. Agreed. Somehow, MacLeod found his way to the spot on Boston Common where they had agreed to stage the duel. He had with him no seconds, and stated he did not want any. All he wanted to do was get it over with, so that he could either drink further and pass out, or go home to bed. Bassett had brought with him a doctor, two seconds, and his man Hotchkiss. The dueling blades were brought forth, and Bassett made his selection. Hotchkiss said, The heavier blade, Mr. Bassett, I implore you, I am fighting this duel, Hotchkiss, not you, came the impatient reply. The blade was tested for strength and whip. The seconds were inspecting the ground beneath the old oak, though it had been inspected a thousand times before. The spot was a famous dueling ground. Having satisfied themselves that they had done their duty, they signalled to Mr. Bassett and to MacLeod though the latter was paying little attention to them. He had been studying a jay on the bow of the oak and thinking how beautiful it looked in the rays of the early dawn sun. Are you ready, sir? called Bassett. Eh? What? Mr. Bassett sighed and said to his seconds, See if the imbecile is ready. Mr. Jones came up to him. Uh, Mr. Bassett wishes to know if you're ready, sir. Of course I'm ready, sir. I'm the one who's been kept waiting. Then will you please take the sword? He was offered the remaining blade, an epee. 
Bassett had taken the foil. On guard! The two blades crossed. There was a flurry from the blade of Mr. Bassett, a slight pain in MacLeod's heart as the thin blade went through it, though it was considerably dulled by the amount of alcohol that was flowing through the organ at the time, and the uninjured gentleman began to walk away. MacLeod fell over, climbed back onto his feet, and called to his opponent, whose back was now to him. Hey! What about this jewel? Bassett stopped in his tracks and turned around, a look of amazement on his face. His seconds, too, were staring pop-eyed. Hotchkiss said, Oh my god! You must have missed him, Mr. Bassett! Bassett growled, I can assure you, Hotchkiss, that I did not miss. I saw my blade go through his chest. It has not hit a vital organ, that is all. We shall have to do it again. MacLeod staggered forward to cross blades again, and his wig fell over his eyes. Jesus! he cried. I've gone blind! Mr. Bassett's blade again went slickly and cleanly through his heart. MacLeod dropped to the ground. Bassett began to walk away, wiping the blade of the foil. MacLeod climbed to his feet. Hotchkiss shrieked. The seconds whirled. MacLeod said, Hi. Now what? Bassett stamped his foot in frustration. He stepped forward again, and once, twice, three times, ran the body of MacLeod through with his foil. MacLeod fell over and then climbed back to his feet. Now! Bassett tried several more places of penetration, getting more and more frustrated all the time. He was also getting angry with Hotchkiss, who was dancing around on the periphery of his vision. That's it, Mr. Bassett! There! And there! Yes! Oh, oh no! He's back on his feet, sir! Uh, try again! Uh, there! No, uh, there! Just below the collarbone! Very good, sir. Uh, no, uh, not working, I'm afraid. The seconds were becoming appalled by the carnage that was not a carnage. Finally, MacLeod yelled, Stop, sir! Uh, I beseech you. I am getting tired and a little sober. One or the other will have to go. I apologize for calling your wife a bloated warthog, and I bid you good day. He turned on his heel and began to walk away. Hotchkiss grabbed a pistol from one of the seconds and pushed it into the hands of Bassett. Shoot him, sir! Bassett ignored him, throwing down the foil in disgust. Must shoot him, sir! cried Hotchkiss, dancing around his master, before he gets out of range. Hotchkiss, stop it! Please leave me alone! But the servant was not to be put off. He was thoroughly agitated by this time. He wanted blood, MacLeod's blood. His master deserved it. Shoot him, sir! Have to shoot him! Bassett said, Hotchkiss, I swear! Hotchkiss ran a little away after MacLeod and pointed. In the back, sir! Quickly! Shoot! Shoot! Mr. Bassett indeed fired at that point, but the yelp of pain was not from MacLeod, but from Hotchkiss, who began doing a very different dance around the common, clutching his rump. Ow! Sir! He shrieked. Sir! Yes, that was some duel, said Castigir. I could tell that to my grandchildren, if I had grandchildren. Don't remind me of my weakness, Castigir, just when I need to recall my strengths, said MacLeod. Meaning? 
meaning that immortality, the way we possess it, has robbed us of a more traditional concept of immortality, life through our offspring. You think that is a weakness in us? Most definitely. They walked on in silence for a while, suddenly aware that they had little to say to each other, even after a hundred years. Especially after a hundred years. Too little and too much happens over such a great expanse of time. They had no reference points with each other. They had recalled a brief meeting between them, two brief meetings if the duel was to be counted, and now they had nothing to say to one another. They shook hands without another word and parted at the entrance to the park.